From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I live and work in the middle of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. This episode covers the disappearance of a woman right here on Kodiak Island in 1986. What happened to Laura Henderson? This is one of the most controversial court cases in the history of the state of Alaska. At best, this case is an example of an inept police investigation, a prosecution determined to win at any cost, and inadequate defense counsel. At worst, this case represents a corrupt police force and perhaps a corrupt judicial system. No one can even prove a crime occurred because a body was never found. Yet, two men have been sentenced to serve 99 years in prison for the murder of Laura Henderson. It is unlikely Laura is alive since none of her friends or family, including her two daughters, have heard from her since March 28, 1986. But what happened to her is still very much in question. Let me tell you the facts, and then you decide if this crime happened the way the prosecutors claimed it did. This case involves many individuals with conflicting stories and testimony that changed over time. I will do my best to keep the various players and their stories straight for you. Laura Henderson disappeared on March 28, 1986, and this is one of the few certainties in this case. Laura Henderson had recently divorced Jack Eibach, her husband of seven years, and the two were engaged in a contentious custody battle over their two daughters. They currently shared custody of their children, but Laura was seeking sole custody so she and her daughters could move to Oregon to be closer to family. Laura and her two daughters lived in an apartment in Kodiak, and Laura worked at the Women's Resource Crisis Center. Attorney Matthew Jamin represented Laura in her divorce proceedings. On March 28, 1986, Laura Henderson received a call at the Women's Resource Crisis Center. She later told her attorney that she did not recognize the caller's voice, but the man told her he had a tape which would incriminate her ex-husband, Jack Eibach, in some way, and the caller claimed the tape would help her win the custody battle for her two children. The man and Laura agreed to meet at 9 p.m. near the King Crab Cannery in Kodiak, and he promised to give her the tape at the meeting. At 3 o'clock on the afternoon, Laura disappeared. Donald McDonald, who goes by the name of Mac, stopped by the crisis center to talk to Henderson. According to Mac, he and Laura were friends and had dated a few times. He claims he stopped by the center to invite Laura to a dance he was co-hosting to raise money for Kodiak's Hope House, a drug and re alcohol rehabilitation facility where Mac resided. Laura politely declined his invitation, but asked him if he would find her some cocaine. Again, according to Mac, he had been clean and sober for several months and had no intention of scoring drugs for Laura. But he promised to try to get her the drugs for her only because he wanted an excuse to see her again. Laura told Mac she would be on Shelikoff Street to meet someone around 9 p.m., and if he had drugs, she would meet him there. Mac claimed he and Laura had been friends for quite a while. The police, however, stated Mac and Laura were not acquainted, and instead they believed Mac was the mysterious stranger who told Laura he had a tape incriminating her ex-husband. Friends testified at trial that Mac and Laura knew each other, so Mac could not be the mysterious man to whom Laura had referred. Laura's co-workers testified Laura told them Mac offered her information she could use against Eibach, and they said Mac told Laura he would meet her at 9 p.m. to give her the incriminating tape. So, let me recap. Mac and his friends claim Mac and Laura knew each other, so Mac could not be the mysterious stranger. The police and Laura's co-workers, though, testified Mac and Laura did not know each other, and Mac was the stranger who told Laura he had incriminating evidence against her ex-husband. 
After her shift at the crisis center ended, Laura went to her lawyer, Matt Jamin's office, and told him about the 9 p.m. meeting. She indicated she did not know the man she would be meeting. Jamin was concerned about the meeting and hired a private investigator named Albert Rubel to follow Laura and watch over her. Rubel agreed to tail Laura to the meeting and to watch her from a nearby hidden location. At 9 p.m., Laura drove to the King Crab Cannery for her meeting. On her way to the cannery, she passed Rubel, who was sitting in his car. As soon as Laura passed him, Rubel claims he started his car and followed her. As he neared the cannery, he saw Henderson's car parked behind a white van. And as he drove past the van, he saw Laura inside the van talking to someone. At this point, Rubel changed his story several times. But he first stated he drove past the van and was out of sight of the van for less than a minute. But during that crucial minute, the van disappeared. Rubel said he searched the area and then reported Henderson's disappearance, along with a description of the van and the license plate number, to the police. Then, according to Rubel, he, Jamin, and Henderson's parents searched for the van. Several hours later, Hen Laura Henderson's stepfather spotted a van matching Rubel's description parked at the rehab center where Mac was staying. Mac's version of the events of that night are slightly different than Rubel's. He says he ate dinner at his dorm and then went to McDonald's restaurant for dessert with Gladys Baldwin, the house mother of his rehab dorm, and his friend Jim Kerwin, who was homeless and living in Mac's van at the time. Not long after they left McDonald's, Mac dropped Gladys back at the dorm, and then he and Kerwin drove around town for a while. They met Laura on Shelikoff Street, and she got into Mac's van. She asked Mac if he had been able to score her some cocaine, and soon after she learned he did not have the drugs, she exited his van. He says she was in the van no longer than five minutes. Mac signed back into his dorm between 9.50 and 10 p.m., and we know this time frame is certain because several other people signed in after him at 10 p.m. The house manager then locked the house so no one could leave during the night and one of the other residents testified he watched a movie with Mac until 1 a.m. the following morning. So we know Mac was back in his dorm before 10 p.m. where he spent the night. As you will see later, this timeline is important in understanding this case. Mac was arrested the following day, and his van was impounded. James Kerwin, Mac's friend who was living in Mac's van, was also arrested. Police found three knives in Mac's possession and two firearms in his van. According to court documents, the van was dirty and wet, but police photos show a neatly organized van. One of the van's cargo windows was cracked, and police testified it had been broken from the inside shortly before the van was seized. The previous owner of the van, though, testified the window was already broken when he sold the van to Mac. The police search of the van yielded little evidence. They found no blood or tissue residue in the van, and although they found fingerprints in the van belonging to 59 people, none of the prints belonged to Laura Henderson or her ex-husband, Jack Eibach. Police also compared soil samples from under the frame of the van and from the tire grooves to the place where they allege Mac dumped Laura's body, but the soil samples did not match. Police did find the back from an earring in the van and an Instamatic camera. When they developed the film in the camera, they found photos of Mac and Kerwin outside a cabin. They soon located the cabin at the end of Menashka Bay Road, a 40-minute drive from Kodiak. The police postulated that Jack Eibach hired Mac to murder Laura. Mac then met Laura at 9 p.m. on March 28, 1986, got her into his van, killed her, drove to Menashka Bay near the cabin he had photographed, and he and Kerwin tossed her body off a cliff. As I will explain shortly, there are several problems with this theory. A witness said at 9.35 p.m. on March 28th, she saw a van matching the description of Mac's van, leaving a residence near where Mac lived. According to the witness, the driver pulled out of the driveway in front of her and swerved all over the road. Another witness reported that between 9.45 and 10 p.m., he saw a white van near the end of the Menashka Bay Road. 
Police learned that Jim Kerwin and Jack Eibach knew each other and reportedly had met several times in the month preceding Laura's disappearance. According to other witnesses, Jack Eibach made several statements claiming he wished his ex-wife would disappear. One friend stated Jack told her he wanted to kill Laura, and he said he planned to pay a man to do the job. The hitman Eibach described to his friend fit the general description of Jim, Jim Kerwin. Police arrested Jack Eibach, and he, Mac, and Jim Kerwin were all charged with kidnapping and murder of Laura Henderson. In the months leading up to the trial, several items of clothing matching what Laura reportedly had been wearing when she disappeared washed up in the surf at Menashka Bay, below the cliff where police say Mac and Kerwin stood as they tossed Laura's body into the ocean. The clothing looked suspiciously undamaged, as if it had not been in the ocean for several months. A purse also washed up, and while the purse did belong to Laura, it was one she hadn't carried in years and had long since given to her daughters to play with. Inside the purse, police found Laura's expired driver's license from Oregon instead of her current Alaska driver's license. Even more curious was a shoe found in the surf. Laura's mother told police Laura had been wearing size 9 pink shoes on the night she disappeared. Her mother also said Laura recently had undergone surgery on her foot to remove a planter's wart and was still wearing the Band-Aid on the foot. The shoe found in the ocean was a left shoe, and sure enough, there was a Band-Aid in it. After all the legal proceedings were over, though, trial records included a report from Laura's podiatrist indicating Laura's surgery had been on her right foot, not on her left foot. In any case, it was cold the night Laura disappeared, and she must have been wearing socks, so how did a Band-Aid end up in her shoe instead of in her sock? In August 1986, two months before the trial was to begin, Kodiak Police Department Corporal Michael Andre saw an advertisement for a psychic in a police magazine and decided to contact the psychic about the case. The psychic told Andre to search Mac's van again, and even though Mac's van already had been thoroughly searched, Andre sent Kodiak Police Department Corporal Barry Paris alone to inspect the van. After the original search of Mac's van, the van had been moved to an unsecured wrecking yard, and this is where Paris reportedly looked through the driver's side window and saw something glistening near the gas pedal. Paris then instructed two of his subordinates to take a closer look at the van, and on the floor, in plain sight, they discovered a porcelain earring with a purple flower painted on it, just like the earrings Laura Henderson had last been seen wearing. The police deduced that during a struggle, Laura's earring had been knocked from her ear and had traveled down the front window defroster slot. They then speculated that when they towed the van to the wrecking yard, the jarring motion caused the earring to fall through the heater defroster system to the floor. Max lawyer nor anyone else ever tried to prove or disprove this theory, but it has since been determined if the earring had followed the path the police suggested, it would have ended up on the floor of the heater housing delivery system and not on the floor of the van. The first trial for Mac, Jack Eibach, and James Kerwin began on October 27, 1986, in Anchorage, Alaska. I think it is relevant to the outcome of this case that the men were tried in Anchorage and not in Kodiak, because most Kodiak residents would have realized there was a problem with the prosecution's timeline in the case. Each defendant had his own lawyer, and while they were tried together, their guilt or innocence was to be determined separately by the jury. Jim Kerwin was acquitted of all charges, while Jack Eibach received a hung jury on both charges. The jury was also deadlocked on the charge of murder for Mac, but found him guilty of kidnapping Laura Henderson. Jack Eibach and Mac were tried again in Anchorage in mid-April 1987. Both Mac and Jack had inept attorneys, especially at their second trial. Mac's attorney promised to let him testify and said she would call Jim Kerwin as an alibi witness for him. But something happened at the last minute, and she rested her case without calling any witnesses or allowing Mac to testify. 
She reportedly still will not answer questions regarding this case. Both Jack Eibach and Mack were found guilty of the murder of Laura Henderson, and they were both sentenced to 99 years in prison. Much has been written about this case in the more than 30 years since Donald McDonald and Jack Eibach were sentenced. Unfortunately, if some of this evidence had come to light before their trials, they might never have been convicted of kidnapping and murdering Laura Henderson. Mack appealed his conviction, but the appellate court found against him on every issue. Many of the appeal issues dealt with hearsay evidence the judge allowed by classifying it as under the excited utterance rule. I don't have the legal expertise to discuss these issues, but I will point out a few glaring inconsistencies with the evidence, as well as the changing testimony of some key witnesses and the questionable conduct of the Kodiak Police Department. As I mentioned earlier, this case was tried in Anchorage, and I think this venue hurt the defendants because jurors not familiar with the Kodiak Island Road system missed one of the biggest problems the prosecution had with their case, the timeline. With perfect road conditions in a good vehicle, it takes approximately one hour and 15 minutes to drive round trip from where Laura was last seen in Kodiak to the end of the road at Menashka Bay, where police and prosecutors claim Mac tossed Laura's body off a cliff. The speed limit on the road was 55 miles per hour at the time of Laura's disappearance. Mac had an old van, and because the drive shaft was wired to the transmission, it would not go faster than 35 miles per hour. Furthermore, according to one Kodiak police officer, the roads were very icy the night Laura disappeared, and it was nearly impossible to drive more than 5 miles per hour. Yet, the prosecution put one witness on the stand who testified she saw a van matching the description of Mac's van in Kodiak at 935 and another witness who claimed he saw the white van on the road near Menashka Bay 10 to 20 minutes later. It is impossible Matt could have covered the distance from Kodiak to Menashka Bay in such a short amount of time in his van on those roads. Furthermore, Laura was last seen alive at 9 p.m., and Mac signed back into his dorm by 10 p.m. at the latest. How could he have murdered Laura, driven all the way to Menashka Bay, drug her body to the cliff, tossed her into the ocean, and then driven back to town in less than an hour? It's an impossible theory. Al Rubel, the private investigator who supposedly followed Laura that night, claimed he last saw her at 9 p.m. He then went to tell Matt Jamin, Laura's attorney, he lost track of her. Jamin and Rubel then admit they saw Jack Eibach sitting in a bar between 9.30 and 10 p.m. So Eibach also did not have time to drive to Menashka Bay to dispose of Laura's body. The police were convinced Mac and Kerwin tossed Laura's body off the cliff at Menashka Bay. But in order to throw her off the Menashka Bay cliff, the two men had to somehow propel the body of a 150-pound or 68-kilogram woman straight out from the cliff over a distance of 50 feet or 15.2 meters to clear the rock outcroppings so she would land in the ocean. Before Mac's first trial, his attorney asked two men to attempt to throw a sack filled with 150 pounds off the cliff, and they couldn't do it. The sack ended up on the side of the mountain. The attorney tried to enter the demonstration as evidence, but the judge ruled it inadmissible. The television show Inside Edition televised a segment on this case and traveled to Kodiak to recreate the prosecution's theory of how the body had been tossed off the cliff into the ocean. They proved it was not possible for two men to throw a 150-pound body 50 feet horizontally before it began to plummet into the ocean. After Jim Kerwin was acquitted in his first trial, the prosecution suggested Mack threw the body off the cliff by himself, which is even more impossible. I mentioned earlier how clothes similar to those worn by Laura the night she disappeared conveniently washed up in the surf near Menashka Bay months later. Menashka Bay, like most areas of Kodiak Island, gets pounded by surf and storm surges, not to mention the motion of the large tidal fluctuations in the area. It is highly unlikely the clothes would have stayed in one place for such a long time. The clothes recovered from the surf were not faded when they were found, and one police officer admitted they did not look as if they had been in the ocean long. 
The pink shoe with the Band-Aid in it also makes no sense, since the Band-Aid was in the wrong shoe, and what happened to Laura's socks? Also, why would Laura have been carrying an old purse with an expired driver's license instead of the purse she usually carried? Why were none of these questions asked at trial? Laura Henderson was obviously not killed in Mac's van. There was no blood or tissue found in the van, but police claimed a violent struggle took place in the van, and they suggested Laura struggled so hard she kicked a cargo window in the van and cracked it. The previous owner of the van testified the window was already cracked when he sold the van to Mac, and the forensics expert who processed the van stated he saw no evidence a crime had taken place in the van. I think it's interesting Jim Kerwin stated repeatedly he was with Mac the entire evening of March 28, 1986. But Kerwin was found not guilty of all charges. Why was Kerwin not called by Mac's attorney to testify to Mac's whereabouts and the events of the night in question? The first thorough search of Mac's van provided no evidence, but nine days before the first trial was to begin, a psychic suggested police search the van again. So after receiving the psychic's advice, Kodiak Police Department Corporal Paris went alone to inspect the unsecured van at Bruce's wrecking yard. Paris claimed he looked in the window and saw something glistening near the gas pedal. So he sent two detectives to search the van again and they found the critical evidence of an earring similar in appearance to the earrings Laura was wearing the night she disappeared. The search of the van was conducted outside the presence of a Bruce's Wrecking Yard employee, a violation of the contract between Bruce's Wrecking Yard and the Kodiak Police Department. But despite the fact the earring was found in an unsecured van, the judge had no qualms about allowing the earring to be entered into evidence at trial. When police first interviewed Laura's co-workers, only one claimed to know Laura was planning to meet a mysterious man on the evening of March 28, 1986. But she said Laura did not know who the man was and did not recognize his voice on the phone when he called to set up the meeting. When police asked the co-workers to come into the station to write their statements, though, they put all the co-workers in a room together and suddenly, Laura's colleagues all recalled that Laura was planning to meet a man named Matt in a white van the night she disappeared. Why did their statements change? Were they fed information? They got Mac's name wrong, and instead of writing the name Mac, M-A-C, in their statements, they used the name Matt, M-A-T-T, and Matt, M-A-T-T, was the name of Laura's attorney. So what did those statements mean? Al Rubel, the private investigator tasked with watching over Laura while she met the mysterious stranger, changed his story several times. He first told police he sat in his car at an agreed-upon spot, and when Laura drove past him, he waited until she got out of her car, and then he drove past her in the white van to find a better vantage spot. He said he lost sight of the van for only a minute, but the van with Laura in it disappeared during the time it was out of his view. He then changed his story and said he got out of his car and walked down the street to get a better view and lost sight of the van. He then changed his story one more time and said he remained parked in the same spot the entire time and Mac drove away out of his sight. Laura disappeared in a quiet section of a small town. Al Rubel was either a very bad detective a bad liar, or both. Numerous people have suggested Al Rubel knew much more about Laura's disappearance than he admitted. Some believe he was the last person to see Laura alive, and they believe he knows what happened to her. It is suspicious that when Rubel lost track of Laura, he did not attempt to find her. He did not search any of the numerous bars in the area, nor ask anyone if they had seen Laura. He simply reported her disappearance to Matt Jamin, and they called the police to report a kidnapping. What happened to Laura Henderson? Sadly, we probably will never know what happened to Laura Henderson. She disappeared over 33 years ago, and her remains still have not been found. Laura Henderson was involved in the drug community in Kodiak, and she was a police informant. 
A drug dealer by the name of James, James McLaughlin told several people he killed Laura Henderson because she knew too much about his drug dealings and he suspected she was planning to inform on him to the police. The police were aware of McLaughlin's admission, but they chose to ignore it. It is also very possible Mac and James Eibach were involved in Laura's murder. But the facts of this case prove the murder did not occur in the manner suggested by the Kodiak Police Department and the prosecutors. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review at Apple Podcasts so other listeners can find me. I've written three Alaska wilderness novels, and my fourth novel will be released soon. Check the show notes to learn more about my novels. I also write a newsletter about murder and mystery in Alaska. If you would like to receive my newsletter, check the link in the show notes to sign up for it. I write one newsletter a month, and it will include the links to my podcast for the month. Also, please check the show notes for my social media links, and I invite you to connect with me. Soon I hope to have a Facebook page dedicated to my podcast. Thank you again. And I will see you next time with murder and mystery from the last frontier. Thank you.